Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was in India once before in 2013, just for a holiday, and I, I had never been to Bangalore before, so I was very glad to receive the invitation to come here and uh, learn quite a lot at this workshop so far. So it, it's been a real treat. Uh, Anosh emailed us a few months ago and asked us if he could use a plot from our paper. And when I heard that, I felt obligated to tell you about the work that the plot came from. So this is uh, what I'm going to be speaking about today. Uh, it's work that I do as part of my side project here in the Monte Carlo string and M theory collaboration. We picked it because it's palindromic. Uh, I, I'm really a nuclear physicist, so uh, please bear with me if I make anything uh, unclear. Um, this is work that I've done with Enrico Masanori, uh, Pavlos Goro, and uh, Shinji and Somatsura, uh, as well as other work that we've done that I, I may not get to, but I've prepared slides in case I go much faster than I actually mean to. Uh, yeah, okay, so what What's the big picture? Here's this uh, comic from XKCD, which is a well-known uh, web comic, and it's string theory summarized. I just had an awesome idea. Suppose all matter and energy is made of tiny vibrating strings, and okay, what would that imply? I don't know, right? And of course, the people in this room don't actually believe this. It's a, a cartoon of what string theory is actually supposed to be like, and a lot of people say, I know, but I only know perturbatively. And the aim, of course, is to eliminate this and so say, I know, even non-perturbatively. Right? This is one of the, the dreams and one of the uh, ultimate goals behind this whole program of relating uh, string theory to gauge theory uh, and relating gravity to gauge theory. Okay, so what am I going to be talking about today, uh, it's the same as what we've been hearing uh, since early this morning. I'm going to be talking about the zero plus one D zero brain quantum mechanics, or sometimes I'll call it the BFSS matrix model. And it's this model here. Uh, and I did some color coding so that I can remember all of the terms. So it's a gauge theory. So these derivatives are gauge derivatives. We've got the left-handed parts of the 9 plus 1 dimensional gamma matrices, making these guys 16 uh, Weilfer or Majorana fermions. Uh, and then there are these nine bosonic uh, n by n matrices that come from compactifying or dimensionally reducing uh, some higher dimensional theory to this 0 plus 1 space. Um, yeah, so they're self-interaction terms. These are the terms that can potentially have flat directions. There are these Yukawa terms that let the bosons interact with the fermions. Uh, and at least in this setup, it has an obvious non-perturbative definition, which is that it's a discretized quantum mechanics. And this quantum mechanics is defined for all values of n and all values of the coupling, and it's manifestly unitary. So if you can discover things about gravity in here, then you know that you have a unitary description and don't have to worry about all sorts of bad things like information loss and things like that. Okay. Um, good. Right. So as we heard, there was this conjecture that this theory uh, is equal to M theory. And here's my little cartoon of how I like to think about this theory. So if uh, you think of some large number of D0 brains, which are represented here by my little black dots, then the coordinates of these D0 brains sort of live on the diagonal of these bosonic matrices, and there's M of them, one for each direction. Uh, and the off-diagonal elements represent the strings that couple these D0 brains together. And if you have this one big bunch, that is, you have all non-commutative matrices with all the off-diagonal elements populated, this thing is supposed to look like a black zero brain or a black hole. Okay, so that's the idea. And as we heard, uh, it's supposed to be a second quantized theory. So if you have a matrix that sort of looks like this, where you have big block diagonals, where th this thing is 
really non-commutative, and this thing is really non-commutative, but they don't talk to each other. This looks like sort of doing some kind of fox base thing where you created a state that looks like this by just sort of tensor or direct sum of gluing two of these matrices together. Uh, it's also possible that you might have to worry about radiation, right? Uh, black holes are supposed to evaporate, and that should correspond to some kind of D-zero brain getting emitted from this big bunch. And that would look something like this, where you have a, a big matrix that's n by n, and just one of these guys escapes, and it's uh, stringy connections to all the other D0 brains are zero or very, very suppressed. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk is uh, how we studied this system uh, using Monte Carlo. And of course, I just told you that the state is that we're interested in is some kind of uh, metastable state. This is a physical effect because the black holes are supposed to evaporate eventually. Right? Uh, and so the question that you can have is how, how likely are you to run into this metastability of your state? Uh, and as Masanori argued last week during the school, uh, the amount of time that it probably takes is proportional to e to the n. And that just comes from counting the number of dynamical degrees of freedom in your theory, or in your state, I guess, uh, where when it's, everything is fully non-commutative, the number of degrees of freedom is n squared. And uh, when you've killed all of these off-diagonal elements, the number of degrees of freedom is n squared minus 1. Um, except that once this happens, and this guy gets far away, the number of degrees of freedom is sort of like you have to supplement it with the log of the space-time volume, or the spatial volume, where this thing can fly around. But the, the point is that if I crank up n far enough, uh, then I can avoid ever hitting configurations where this thing has escaped, and then you worry goes away forever. Uh, so our solution to handling these flat directions is to just crank up n until we never see the metastability, and then we declare that we're happy with our ensembles. Uh, so there's many things that you can calculate uh, using this kind of a setup. Um, and there's been quite a lot of work here. Uh, I'm, it's very likely that this is an incomplete list. So if you see your work up here missing, then I apologize. Um, the work I'm going to talk about today it, is in these two papers, and if I get to the end early, which doesn't seem very likely, uh, I'll talk about this paper as well. Um, good. So of these possible things, one of the things people like to compare is the internal energy of the black hole. Uh, because this thing, at least at the very low temperature limit, uh, at large n, has a definite prediction from supergravity, right? And that statement is that this coefficient here, a zero, is some known number, 7.41. The form of this expansion, t to the 2.8, t to the 4.6, t to the 5.8, and these uh, 1 over n squared corrections, these things are dictated by string theory. Um, so the, the powers are known. But the coefficients, these a1, a2, and b1, these are numbers that no one has managed to calculate with pen and paper before, or other methods. Uh, this b0, which characterizes the leading temperature 1 over n squared corrections, is known through some kind of effective field theory argument that you can find in this paper to be minus 5.7. Yeah, sorry. These are all in non-dimensional units where I've taken the right. of coupling and set it equal to one, or equivalently, every time there's a temperature, there's a lambda to the minus one third secretly in there. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, and similarly on this side. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, good. So the point is that since there's only this one scale in the in the problem, everything is set. 
uh, by that, or the units of everything are set by that scale. Uh, and so low temperature is the same as strong coupling and high temperature is the same as weak coupling and things like this. Okay, good. So this was the state of the field, roughly speaking, uh, of calculations of this form. There was uh, quite a lot of work over the course of 10 years. Um, and there's a lot more data known out in this direction, but if I include it, you can't see the detail of what's going on here. Um, here I'm showing uh, data from two different papers. Uh, the colored points are uh, this paper here by Keito and Kamata, and the black and white points are from Masanori and collaborators. Uh, and what you can see is that there's still some tension between these things uh, in that the error bars on these points are pretty small, but in pretty substantial disagreement. The difference between here and here is many standard deviations away from each other. Right? Uh, so there's some tension about what's going on here. Uh, and what you can see is they fit their data to forms that look like this uh, and fix this number here. So that's putting in information about string theory or the assumption that this theory is supposed to match to supergravity, right? And ultimately, that's the thing you want to check. So putting this in is, uh, is sort of admitting, not defeat, but that you can't get down close enough to really test the correspondence. Okay. Um, Good. These calculations also didn't have any continuum limit, and they didn't take a, a reliable large n. And these things are sort of necessary for making a, a rigorous comparison. So what did we do? We did a large Monte Carlo calculation uh, where we, for many different values of temperature, n, and number of lattice sites, did a lengthy Monte Carlo uh, calculation, making sure that all of our observables in the end look nice and beautiful and Gaussian. Uh, and you can see here in each one of these observables, long autocorrelations. So this is thousands of Monte Carlo steps. And so you can see here, this is hundreds of uh, measurements that sort of all go in the same direction and all are fluctuating together. So it's really important when you do something like this to really have a long Monte Carlo uh, ensemble. Um, the one thing that you can worry about when you do Monte Carlo is the thermalization of your Monte Carlo streams. And essentially, this comes from your Markov chain remembering where you started it from. Right? And you want to make sure that none of that gets uh, contaminated into your actual measurements. So what you can see here is what happens if I drop 150 of the beginning trajectories, 100 of the beginning trajectories, 150 of the beginning trajectories. And so if I go later and later, you would expect my memory of the beginning of the Monte Carlo sample to go away more and more. And so what we do for all of our ensembles is cut 1,000 trajectories, which we think is safe uh, and allows us to avoid remembering any of the beginning of this ensemble. Um, the other thing you want to do is make sure that you have lengthy uh, ensembles. And so what I'm showing here is, suppose I just took, for the red points, a thousand configurations and did my whole analysis on those thousand configurations. Then for the first thousand configurations, I would get something like this. The next thousand, something like this and so on. And what you can see is a thousand configurations does not give you nearly a reliable statistical estimator, right? Because this thing is fluctuating a lot. But as you increase the number of configurations, you get more and more stable. So that's the progression from red to orange to green to blue. And then the black star is the same as the data point on the slide I just showed you. And this is what you get when you analyze the whole ensemble. So I told you what we do for one of the ensembles. Now we have to go and do lots of different ensembles. And so you need a big computer. This is, uh, this is Vulcan, uh, which is the 
Blue Jean Q at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where I was a postdoc before I moved to Germany. Uh, we use this machine a little bit and another machine called Aztec, which is more of a CPU cluster. Uh, here is my data table. Do not try to read it. Uh, it's at the end of the paper, so if you want to pull out our data and play around with it yourself, you're free to do so, but I like to use it uh, a picture like this to intimidate people to make sure they think I actually did something concrete. Uh, okay. So what you can see here is that sometimes we've simulated with an unimproved action and an improved action, and the difference between those two things is some kind of derivative improvement. And if you want to know the details of that, I'll refer you to Masanori's lecture, uh, I don't remember, a few days ago, uh, the video of which I'm sure is up on the ICTS site now. Uh, and so what you can see here is when we simulate with the unimproved action, the convergence towards the continuum limit, the continuum limit is over here, uh, the convergence to the continuum limit happens, but the, the lattice artifacts are much more dramatic. Uh, whereas when you use the improved action, you get a much more reliable continuum limit, and it, it's um, much more mild, which lets you get a finer error on your uh, eventual extrapolation. So that's good. Uh, what you can do then is you can take a fixed n continuum extrapolation. Uh, here I'm showing two or one particular ensemble, and this ensemble was chosen because it, it matches an ensemble from a different work, right? And so what we saw was actually you needed to take very large lattice sizes because if you just did small lattices, it actually looks phenomenally linear, but then it goes down like this. And if you just linearly extrapolate, you get something that ultimately really disagrees with uh, the, the ultimate answer for this uh, extrapolation. So care here uh, was needed. We were surprised that we had to go to such large lattices to see something reliable like this. Uh, okay, the other option is rather than take the continuum limit at each fixed n and then try to take the large n limit, is to take a simultaneous continuum and large n extrapolation. And that's what I'm going to show here. So we can express the energy in some kind of uh, sum over inverse powers of n squared and inverse powers of L. Uh, and this kind of decomposition is valid because the Atuft coupling is still valid for the lattice or the discretized theory. Uh, so I'm going to do a fit where I include these four uh, terms. This guy represents the large n continuum value. These guys represent uh, lattice artifacts. And this guy represents the 1 over n squared continuum value. And so what I do is I take all of these data points that you see here, uh, and I fit all of them to this one function. So I'm fitting a two-dimensional parameter space with some kind of uh, curve here, or plane. Not Well, it's bendy. A two-dimensional manifold is fit to all of these things here. Uh, and then the, the lines here are what happen when I take that best fit and fix L, that is I plug in an L to that best fit and show it as a function of n squared. Or here, when I uh, have taken n to infinity and then show it as a function of L. So the way to read this plot is uh, all of my data points contribute to the infinite uh, sorry, the large n continuum extrapolation, that's this point here. Uh, the other thing that I could do, which is essentially what I was showing on the previous slide, is take the continuum limit along one of these directions, that gives me this point, take the continuum limit along these directions, and then take the large n extrapolation of those three points and get this point with larger error bars. So we can really do a much better job when we do a single simultaneous fit to all of these points. The, this other uh, contribution, the 1 over n squared contribution, 
is, whoa, that happened fast, is the slope of this line here. Right? And it's actually, it looks very mild, but you have to remember we're not going out too far. That is, we don't have too many points at small n because that's where we see the instability in the Monte Carlo. Sorry? None, no. Okay, so we take these points, these E00 points, these are the continuum large n points, uh, and we plot them. This is the Sugra prediction. You hope these match at low temperature. And what more than one person has asked me uh, at this program so far is, without any stringy input, can you say anything interesting? And the answer is yes, but it has, uh, it, it's not confirming what you might think. Uh, that is, if I just fit a simple power law to all of the data that I have here, the answer that I get is the coefficient is 3.13 plus or minus 0.02, and the power is 2.05 plus or minus 0.3. And it, the fit quality is amazing. And so it looks like this thing is going like pi t squared. Do not take this seriously or do and figure it out. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not married to this. It just seems to be a numerical coincidence. Uh, but okay, anyway, if I, if I don't have any input from string theory, I can't do very well in trying to match to Sucre. That's the point here. What can I do? Uh, well, one thing that I can do is I can assume the form of the series here uh, and try to fit these coefficients, these a0, a1, a2. Uh, and using the data that we've got, uh, we can do some very nice fits. So here I'm showing uh, the Suger prediction, the two uh, fits that I showed you earlier, and, uh, excuse me, the fits where I include the leading and correction term, this is an alpha prime correction, uh, or where I include three or four terms in this expansion. And what you see is that we can do a, a very good job fitting all the way down, uh, and it, we have very small errors, it, it works beautifully, and we can extract this leading coefficient to be 7.4 plus or minus a half. So this is about a 10% uncertainty. The number, I'll remind you, that is known analytically from the gravity side is 7.41, blah, 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 yeah. High temperature is perturbation theory, no? You can do the same with uh, weak coupling with the, uh, and am I, am I right or wrong? You want to see me match to a straight line out here? I, I, I'm, I'm asking. I think you're right, yeah, I think that's right. That so high temperature is perturbation theory. Yeah. So, so what is the prediction of perturbation theory? Yeah, it's perturbation theory around the matrix. Yes. Then it becomes linear. That okay. is, okay. e over n squared uh, goes like 60. So you know the slope, and uh, so it matches. Uh, so from the calculations that we've done, we didn't go out here. But from but you can see what is the asymptotic of your data. And whether it goes towards the yeah, perturbative result. It actually would be interesting. Right? Called we study such high temperature. And there, you know, SEO4, SEO5 is already good enough to control flat direction, and we could see perfect agreement with the previous results. Yes. But there's no continuum limit. Uh, there is there. Uh, we we took, but uh, you know, took it to a continuum limit. We could just need uh, three, four points. Anyway, the the evidence there it, it starts in the earliest work in this field, and it it really looks pretty good. Uh, okay. What else can we try to do? Something that previous work tried to do was to extract the value of this exponent, uh, and what I mean here is let this thing hang free. Uh, and try to extract that value. That's the leading alpha prime corrections. Oh boy. Uh, and what we find is actually when we f include just one alpha prime correction term, we can actually do a reliable job. And what we think this means is that we're trying to fit data where the next alpha prime correction is very important. This green fit here that Kato and Kamada performed 
they had four or five data points in just this area and were able to reliably extract uh, this 4.6 number pretty reliably. If we include some information from string theory uh, that is the separation between this power and the next power is supposed to be six-fifths. There's a term in between that's three-fifths, but its coefficient in string theory is known to be zero. Right? So this includes information about how the expansion goes and that some of the coefficients are zero, right? the truth in advertisement. If we assume this form, then we can extract this power and get it to be 4.6 pretty cleanly. But that includes input from string theory, so it's not a first principles extraction of this thing. To get it, we would need to go further down in temperature, and this is quite expensive. Okay, uh, I'll just say something short about the 1 over n squared corrections. These come from fitting that slope uh, in the, the two-dimensional fit that I was describing earlier, uh, and these are the points that we get for that, this is E1, which by what I mean is this function, that's the order n squared correction. Uh, and so these are the data points we get. This thing is supposed to be known at low temperature uh, to be this 5.77 t to the 2 fifths. Uh, and what we can try to do is fit just the next correction, or we can try to fit both contributions. And what I'm showing here are the numbers that come out of doing this fit. So what you can see here is that we get the central value pretty accurately, which you can see just from the agreement between the dashed lines and the, the string theory prediction down here, but with very large uncertainties. Right? And this is because it's very hard to constrain the 1 over n squared corrections when the thing that you're doing to regulate the instability is cranking up n, right? So that, that's sort of a methodological thing that makes it very hard for us to control these numbers. Uh, and with that, I, I'd like to conclude. Uh, these kinds of procedures uh, can give you a non-perturbative test, checking that the gauge theory at low temperatures really can match the prediction from gravity. So we're continuing along this program and really trying to push the temperature down, which may involve cranking up n even higher. Uh, and these non-trivial checks of the gauge gravity duality, I think, are really on their way. Um, moreover, you can get information about the 1 over n squared corrections. Uh, and this corresponds to quantum gravity corrections, right? So I think the, the numbers that we pulled out, I mean, they're not very precise here. This is 100% error. Uh, but with a, some additional work, we'll be able to make predictions about what string theorists who are working with pen and paper may be able to see. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. Nice talk. Uh, questions? Could you say something about where these different powers of t are coming from and what's uh, these alpha prime corrections, for example, that are used in all of these sort of fits? And what's the sort of, uh, yeah. where do those numbers come from? These, you mean where does 14, I forget. Well, not so much the leading term, but the subleading terms. Yeah, so uh, I don't know the derivation in my head, but I know that what comes out is that the corrections go like t to the powers of three-fifths. Uh, and the first two are known to be zero, and then the fourth one is known to be zero. Uh, so you can see the difference here. Did I say it right? Three-fifths? Yeah, right? Uh, there. So correction start, should start with uh, alpha prime cube. And then alpha prime fifth and alpha prime to the sixth or something. And in order to ex good expansion parameter around supergravity is alpha prime divided by Schwarzschild radius square. 
And that number can be extracted if you look at its Akimura Dasena donation and Kilovich paper. That's a t to the minus, uh, t to the that's three that's over five. The differences between. And it, so essentially, power counting around supergravity solution. More questions? Yeah, danger. Uh, just to finish that, can't they one of rain come from uh, from uh, higher derivative corrections to the supergravity as well, the leading one over n and there? With yeah. Um, um, did you actually try to fit the coefficients that are zero? Did you put those terms in? Yes. Uh, Do you get zero? Well, what you find is they're all correlated with one another with a hundred percent error. That is, if you assume that they're there and try to fit that they're zero, your fitter goes crazy, basically. Which, of course, is not something that you like to see, right? Um, and yeah, I don't have... I mean, the, the problem is these powers are very close together, right? And so knowing that the coefficients are zero lets you separate the powers from one another. Uh, and when you have powers that are close together, your fitter can shuffle just, you know, we the range of the data is not very broad, right? So it can, with not a lot of additional uncertainty, shuffle numbers from one coefficient to the other and let the powers move around. Yeah. Maybe in D1 or D2 brain case, power corresponding to alpha prime is bigger, then it would be easy easier to separate such effect. Or maybe your setup as well. More questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Evan.